Many of you have been asking about bees. So what I thought I'd do, we'd take a bit of a walk, see what we could find. Whilst we're going to a site that I know is quite good for some of the mining bees, let's just have a look at um, the bees that we might find. Honeybee, there's one species we know about. Uh, we know about that. Bumblebee, about 25 species. Those are the big sort of woolly jobs. And then there's the solitary bees where there are over 250. Uh, they can be divided into the mining bees that make holes in the ground, which is what we're walking towards hopefully uh, in a minute or two. And then the cavity bees that make holes or, or, or use existing cavities, either in sticks, twigs, uh, masonry, that sort of thing. Um, it's now May. The May blossom has been a bit early this year. Um, some of it is going over. Cow parsley is sort of at its peak. So now is a fairly good time to have a look to, at the different bees that we might be able to find. This is a particularly good farm for insects. The farmer has some wide margins that we're walking down now, had these for many years. They're not in a stewardship scheme. Um, he also manages his hedges very sympathetically. And uh, we need to talk about that on another one of these uh, video links, because many of the hedges in the country could be managed a bit better. But today we're going to concentrate on bees. We're just coming up to uh, a corner of a field now where for many years there's been a mining bee called Laser Glossum Malacurum, uh, the sharp collared furrow bee to give its English name. Now hopefully we can get down close with the camera and what you'll see are these tiny little we get a bit closer. You can see these tiny little nesting cavities, like mini volcanoes. There's one there with a hole in. The bee digs down, and this is a, a very small bee, about a, th a third the size of a honeybee. Digs down about four to six inches, uh, and then has lots of chambers underground where it fills them with pollen, lays an egg, and then the following year, the young hatch. The important thing about these bees is that they transport dry pollen on their bodies, so they're one of the more effective pollinators. The bumblebee and the honeybee, they transport wet pollen, um, which obviously is of limited, if any value at all, in pollination. It's just the loose pollen on um, honeybees or bumblebees. But these mining bees transport only dry pollen so they are far more effective as pollinators but there aren't as many of them so overall you need huge numbers of these bees to be effective pollinators in in sort of soft and top fruit one of the reasons people use honeybees is that you can farm them i say farm in inverted commas you can move them round you can move the hive so although they're not the best pollinators um, there would be 15,000 in a hive as opposed to a colony like this where there might only be sort of 50 or 60 bees. It's worth just mentioning that we need to be able to distinguish between these mining bees and ants. I'm looking at some ants now that tend to scatter the soil around. I mean this one's fairly easy to, to identify because there's lots of ants moving around. But normally ants sort of scatter the soil on the surface. They don't have this like mini volcano with a hole in. I just noticed this much bigger hole. Um, this is another mining bee, but the hole here is about twice the size of the ones we were looking at a couple of minutes ago. This will be one of the much bigger mining bees. This will be an osmia of some sort. I don't know which um, without seeing the owner. Um, but it just goes to show you that you can estimate the size of the bee by literally the size of the hole in the middle of the volcano. And this one I say is certainly sort of five or six mil across, if not slightly more. Something I do at home, which is a bit of fun, is to build some solitary bee boxes for the red mason bee, um, Osmia bicornis. What I do is make a box, as you can see, and then inside 
if we open it up you can see it's full of glass tubes so you can actually see what's going on the top one I don't know whether you can see that the top one has got uh, nesting going on and pollen in there the lower ones are pupa waiting to hatch from last year but these are quite simple to build and they're quite a lot of fun particularly for children well <laughs> adults as well but it, it's a means of having a look at something that otherwise perhaps at home is is completely overlooked mason bees are very common uh, they don't do any damage to the house some people think they do but if the mortar is in good order they can't do anything to it but putting up these bee boxes certainly is a bit of fun during sort of March April and May there's a cavity here at the end of the house this is used by the tree bee Bombus hypnorum they've been nesting in here for three or four years hopefully whilst I'm talking <laughs> one will fly in or fly out but these bees haven't been in this country all that long in, in bee terms or ecological terms they've only been in here sort of in this country about 30 years um, normally nest in tree cavities but they've obviously found lots of uh, masonry gaps and things in houses quite a colorful looking bee if you looked up uh, tree bee there was one that just came out and, and, and flew away uh, here's a different type of red mason bee box this one's made out of uh, a cardboard material but you can see um, the ends that have been blocked up uh, are full of uh, eggs and pollen waiting to hatch um, the disadvantage of this one is obviously you can't see inside what's going on you can just see one or two bees going in and out um, you can't see it on the on the film but they are a lovely sort of burnished brown chestnut color